Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another of our Royal Society of Medicine In Conversation live series. Uh, tonight, I'm very privileged to uh, have with me Professor Dame Donna Kinnair, who is the, a British nurse and has been Chief Executive and General Secretary of the Royal College of Nursing since 2018. We were just chatting before and she was telling me that uh, she has nearly half a million members, which is even more than the uh, RSM. She specialised in child protection, providing leadership in major hospital trusts in London, in teaching and advising on uh, legal and governmental committees. Donna initially pursued a maths degree, but decided not to complete it. She returned to education, having been encouraged by an occupational health nurse to take up nursing. And she credits her experience growing up with an asthmatic father uh, with showing her the impact that nursing could have on people. Following her training, Donna worked with HIV patients uh, in East London. She subsequently worked as a health visitor in Hackney and uh, then pursued further education, gaining a master's degree in medical law and ethics. Notably, she was one of the four expert advisors in 2001 inquiry into the death of uh, poor eight-year-old Victoria Climbier. She's held a number of uh, important healthcare positions, strategic commissioner for children's services, clinical director of emergency medicine, executive director in nursing and director of commissioning in Southwark. So um, Donna, um, let's, let's actually start with a little bit of background about you because you were saying that, um, that, that your uh, parents came across the, with the, the Windrush generation and uh, you know, just give us a little bit more background about you and the th your three children. Yeah, so um, my parents did come over as part of the Windrush generation in the early 50s. Um, my father, although he had trained as an engineer and had been to university, actually uh, started working in the UK for London Transport. Um, put in, he, as he describes it, the nearest to engineering that they could give him was putting motor starters in double-decker buses. Um, so, uh, and my mother, actually, I'm one of nine children so um born, you know seven of us were born here and um yeah we settled in the london borough of hackney and i have remained there ever since <laughs> you're an e5 lady i used to work at the homerton hospital uh, for 10 years or so when i was uh, consultant at barts as well and uh, it was a pretty tough area but a fantastic vibe there and i think the vibe there now is is even better than it was then it's a buzzy area so you're, you, you've got three kids and some of them are in medicine, nursing, are they? Just tell us a bit about yeah. that. I, I mean, I come from a family that has many nurses. So some in the Caribbean, some in Canada and the United States of America and some here. And um, I have a brother that's a doctor and I have a son who's also a surgeon. I have a, a son who's a teacher and a daughter who thinks that she holds doctors to account because she works for NHS Resolution. <laughs> and, and where is your son uh, a surgeon at the moment? Is he trainee or is he consultant yet? Trainee and right. he works at um, Barts in the London. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you're proud of him. And, and um, I mean, we, we, we should talk a little bit about the Royal College of Nursing and that enormous numbers of nurses who... Uh, who are members of that but it's 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 a royal college and it's a trade union so it's a kind of combination of things isn't it tell, tell, tell us a little bit about the rcn that we don't know already well it was interesting because um being a royal college and a trade union i think it combines the best of both worlds um i think that many many skeptics over the years have said well how can you be both and I think it's really important that if you're advancing practice, you learn from the mistakes that have happened in your profession. And I think just having the combination of both a Royal College and a trade union enables that. So it's really interesting at the moment that as I start to have discussions with individuals, I'm really, really conscious today that many of my members are up in arms about the ratios in um, ITU and the, the patient safety impact that that can have when a particular nurse may be looking after, instead of a ratio of one to one, a ratio of one to five. And therefore that just, it just doesn't impact just on 
um, individuals, but it's about the system that we work in and how we can affect change both as a Royal College, but also as a trade union. Yeah. So uh, I think m most of our members at the, um, the RSM majority are doctors, but actually we are looking to extend uh, our offer to you know, other parts of the healthcare profession, much more numerous than the doctors actually. Um, so that's something that we, we are looking at right now. Um, tell us a little bit about, about you know, COVID and nursing. We've heard a lot of the doctors saying it's actually been hell for some of them, you know, the ITU particularly. The surgeons uh, are really fed up because the, the orthopods are not able to do their hip replacements and knee replacements. So they're twiddling their thumbs or being uh, redirected to ITU. But, but I mean, I suppose that probably COVID has been more difficult for nurses than it's been for doctors, would you say? I think it, it's, it's been difficult for everyone. Let's not pretend. When I, uh, in the initial phase of COVID, I went to work at the Nightingale in London. Mm -hmm. And um, it was difficult for everybody because it was a, a new virus. We didn't know a lot about it. So you had the fear of having to go in. It, it just took me back actually. And nobody ever says this, but to the HIV AIDS days when we, we really didn't know what was going on. And we had to deal with this. Uh, we, we saw many patients dying, uh, in, infected, and we really didn't know what was going on. And I think it, it felt very similar to me at the start of this pandemic, because actually, you know, many of the nurses that I worked alongside were concerned about their own health and welfare, as were the doctors. You know, did we have adequate equipment to protect us? And I think it really was important for me as the leader of a Royal College and a trade union to be able to articulate some of the things that my membership was faced in to, was to experience it alongside them. And I think it, it was it was really useful because, it you know, we work as a multidisciplinary team, don't we? So there were scientists, there was doctors, there were nurses, and I was hearing it from all of them. It was important to be there. It was important to do our bit and, and actually you know, wage a war on this virus, but also we were doing that in terms of having families, children, you know, go leave in our homes daily, having mothers, uh, other other people that were concerned about our health and welfare, but do it feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Yeah, well, uh, well, we, we know a bit about the Nightingale because Charles Knight, uh, cardiologist at Barts, was in charge of it. And he's actually spoken on one of our COVID programs a few, few months ago now, and this thing was in the summer. Um, but I probably the Nightingale would be kind of privileged because I bet you had enough uh, protective gear there. Everything would be like super duper. But what about, you know, at, at the, the Homerton or um, down on East, in Eastbourne or somewhere? I mean, did, were you getting messages from your nurses that they felt insufficiently protected by uh, PPE? I think at all the time, actually, I received messages from the word go, which is why it was important for me to embed myself sometimes in the service. And uh, yes, uh, what was really important in, interesting was that some services had been completely forgotten, you know, left behind. Um, so if I think about mental health services, one of the first calls that I ever took from a nurse was somebody that was working in uh, mental health services, delivering care in an undifferentiated environment, you know, depoting injections. And um, every single time this nurse was in complete trepidation, but doing it anyway, and then she would ask for some protective equipment and the, the response would come down, well, actually that you having protective e equipment would be outside who guidance. Um, so it, it got to this level where I remember saying to this individual nurse, I think they need you more than you need them at this moment in time. So they better provide you with some of that equipment so that you can carry out your care safely. So, and, and that was just, that was just one, but if I talk to you about some of the hospitals that were ringing me, um, people were, I think, using um, PP rather sparingly, and, and my interpretation was that of that was that it felt as though it was okay to put people at risk. And as for the community services, well, they'd even forgot to order uh, PP for them. Yeah. So, so I mean, we, we don't want to get too political and end up, when we're not really allowed to criticise the government at the RSM. Uh, but when uh, 
Matt Hancock comes on and says, you know, there was enough protective equipment um, uh, provided. W would, would you say that he, that might be a slight exaggeration? Well, I'd say that it wasn't representative of what my members were telling me. And they would be saying he must be dreaming um, in terms of the experiences that they were having on the ground at some particular points during this pandemic. Yeah, and we saw we saw nurses, you know, on the BBC, we saw nurses in plastic aprons uh, de dealing with these things. We've got a few questions coming in, and we'll be very welcome. People send their questions in. F uh, Felicia Kwaku says she'd like to join you as a nurse. So looks like you've got five, 500,001 nurses now if, if she follows up on the... <laughs> on that um and there's a question from kevin davis about challenges of recruitment you know what what's your vision for a, a future nursing workforce so uh, i think you were telling me that that there are there are more than um half a million nurses in the uk at the moment right and they're probably equivalent numbers might be even seven hundred thousand was the number i forget you can remind me and, and there are probably even more people working in uh, social care who are basically nurses, aren't they? But they're not, they're, they're probably not members of the RCN and they're not, not regarded as nurses, although uh, the, the, a lot of their job will be nursing in terms of care. So, so how, how are we going to deal with the, the shortage of nurses? What, what's, the, what's the number at the moment that, that we're short of nurses roughly? So across the NHS, we're about 40,000 40, nurses short at the moment. Um, that figure has improved somewhat because we've got nurses coming out of retirement in order to uh, support the pandemic. Um, but to be honest, as, a, as the Royal College of Nursing, 45%, between 40 and 45% of my membership is from out is nurses outside of the nhs so actually you do have to be registered once you're a nurse and you're delivering nursing care whether that's in uh, health at or social care mm -hmm. so is that what do you think the government should do to to recruit more nurses i mean perhaps pay them some a better salary would that be a solution well, uh, to be honest, our survey that we did in May last year talked about value in nursing, and that came out as the top priority for nurses in this country. Pay was a significant factor. Uh, they, they equated decent pay with, with valuing them as professionals and for the work that they do. So I think right across, and we know, as, as we've discussed earlier, that if you're in social care, you're even getting less pay. And actually, in, in order to um, improve supply, because even if we have, we've just been through a pandemic, lots and lots of people have seen nurses in, on television, in PP, and that will attract many people to join the profession. But actually, uh, one of our biggest issues is not the attraction of people to join. It's not just solely that. It is also the retention of nurses, because actually, if you are a nurse delivering care on a day-to-day -day basis and it's hard work let's not let's not um pretend it's otherwise and actually you can go into little and not have the same angst or the same worries and earn the same money you might prefer to do that yeah so, so you know i was listening to the budget today and rishi sunak looked um very convincing when he when he gave his story but uh, there was no no sign of any extra money for health care uh, workers, doctors, or nurses, for that matter, and you know, a, a lot of people say well, it's all very well coming, everybody coming out on their front door and clapping for what uh, the healthcare professionals, nursing, and doctors have done. But uh, where, where's any material uh, reward? And so, is the Royal College of Nursing working hard to improve nurses, nursing salaries? How do you well, do? That? We are. We're, I mean, it's incredulous that there's no mention in the budget um, about nursing or doctors. And we recognize that it's in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and we recognize that if um, the chancellor had wanted to, he could have done something about um, our profession and the work and rewarded us for the, a lot of the work that we've done continuously. You know, many of us have left our homes, doctors and nurses and others uh, gone in to deliver the care that has been required of us. And um, actually, 
we're seeing the indication that actually pay is not a top priority, but it is for the professionals that are doing the work day in and day out. And I think it's my job absolutely to speak that truth to, the, to both the Chancellor and to the Health and Social Care Secretary of State, um, because uh, that is value to us. We have stepped up. We've stepped up in spite of a warning the governments over successive periods that actually you have got a massive shortage here. You need to do something about it. We've stayed the you know we stayed with it all through this pandemic, and I think it's only right and proper that nurses are rewarded. And um, we have asked for a twelve and a half percent pay pay rise. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we you know the, the medical profession, uh, the docs anyway. I think I'm sure would be. Um, right behind you they probably like 12 and a half percent themselves as well well you know maybe you know the rcn royal society of medicine all the royal colleges need to get together and um, and lobby for a better pay because um you know a lot of my friends are saying that you know the, the profession nurses and doctors haven't just gone the extra mile they've gone the extra marathon mm -hmm. i mean it's been really really tough for for some, who, who do you think has taken the real brunt of the of the COVID in terms of actually looking after patients? Would you would you say is it, is well, it ICU nurses or? Well, Roger, I'm going to say to you, who looks after nurses? Yeah, yeah. Who, who looks after patients? It's nurses. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, I, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to pitch my profession against yours, but because we both work together and we know that um, care is delivered. Um, not just by one per one particular person, but if you think 24 seven, night and day, who is there on those wards uh, constantly, it is the nursing profession. And no matter how many times people try and dismiss that, I can find no other profession, uh, apart from medics possibly, but no other profession in the healthcare team that are there 24 uh, seven, you know, night and day um, delivering care. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a retired surgeon now, but I can vouch for the fact that um, I just used to swan in and do a ward round in the morning and say hello to the patient, you know, make take a quick look at to make sure things were healing up all right, and then literally disappear. So, you know, all the pressure, all the ongoing care was was by the nurses, and and to have a really good nurse looking after your patient who you can trust when they ring up and say, you know, I'm a bit worried about the urine output or. Uh, or this latest blood results just come back is is a fantastic asset. So yeah, I think um, that that nurses are undervalued in in the NHS, uh, and and definitely um, twelve and a half percent isn't enough. So if it were up to me, if if I were Mr. Hancock, I'd be giving you twenty five percent. Well, we would argue we're worse off than we were ten years ago in terms of pay. So um, I think it's important that we we do get that message across yeah. that you know. Just ignoring us and ignoring the exact the exhausted workforce that exists won't prevent the mass exodus that is likely to happen from those that think actually I've done, I've given it my all I've worked my best and actually it's also important to attract nurses to stay um, because actually if you can do other things and we are multi skilled professionals you just might choose somewhere else to work. Mm. Now, there's some good questions coming through. We've got 26 questions, actually, um, from an audience of nearly a thousand uh, and more, even more people will look at it on YouTube uh, afterwards. So uh, uh, I think it must be Miss Varaganti is saying, could you comment on the importance of nursing healthcare systems in, in the developing world? And, and how can one go about setting up a stronger nursing uh, force there? And this is, she's a medical student from India. Get lots of medical students listening into these talks because I think it helps them with their studies. So, what about the developing world, uh, Donna? Well, as we know, and, and one of the things that, pand that the pandemic will show us that um, it's not good enough for us to look after um, people in our own country. This is a global pandemic, and I and actually just this morning I was having a conversation uh, with the health secretary actually about how we ensure support to our overseas um, nurses and doctors, because mm. it, it is going to be so important because global issues don't just affect one country. And even if we think we've got a vaccine and we're okay, 
we we will need trade we will need all sorts of things for our economy that means that we'll have to interact and we are an inter interdependent set of nations so actually for me it's hugely important that we do our bit to support workforces overseas and help some of those systems that are buckling under pressure. While we have the opportunity, some of us, to refuse vaccines, others aren't even getting them. You know, I was just reading about Sierra Leone where they're not even getting oxygen supplies for patients with COVID. So I think it's hugely important that we invest. It's not just about taking workforce from overseas, but we have got to reinvest to support um, developing countries. Yeah. And, and sadly, I mean, the newspapers are full this morning of uh, the um, resources being offered to Yemen being halved just when they need it more than ever. Uh, and I guess it's true of Sierra Leone, which I understand is a very beautiful country. Um, so, Donna, I mean, I'm, you're, you're a lady of colour or you're a black lady. I'm not quite sure what the best uh, way to describe you, but you're a very lovely lady, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about, about the, the issue of racism in, in the NHS and in, in the UK. Uh, you know, Black Lives Matter has turned the world upside down. It probably um, helped to de-seat Donald Trump, which most people would be quite grateful for in, in the UK, possibly, who knows. Um, but I mean, what's your experience? I mean, you've got to the very top of the nursing profession. You're the, you're the top nurse in Britain and you're, you're a lady of colour. So, is, I mean, have you, have you found, do you think there's unconscious bias against people like you or do you think we're moving away from that now? I think there has been. Um, it would be true to say that often you do face unconscious bias um, wherever you are, whatever system you're in. And I, you know, having been in this country all my life, having gone through the school system, having gone through the university system, I think there's unconscious bias everywhere. I guess for me, it's dep it depends on whether you put that uh, that if, whether you carry that monkey on your back or whether you have the ability to circumvent it and do what you need to do anyway. I guess, you know, my parents did that long arduous journey from the Caribbean and they, they were very clear with us as children that they didn't come here. They came to give us opportunities mm -hmm. and it's up to us to take those opportunities. They didn't ever tell us that it was going to be easy. In yeah. fact, very clear that we would have to work three times as hard as my father used to say uh, as other children so I, I think it's it's really interesting I mean I remember writing an article I think for the Guardian not so long ago about unconscious bias and uh, a doctor wrote to me and said how irresponsible I was um, because all in her hospital got along fine and um, of course I was had just invented this term and I had no right to be popular popularist but of course, that's not her experience, is it? Uh, she can talk from a jolly well, a jolly nice seat from where she probably hadn't encountered some of the difficulties. You know, she probably hadn't encountered someone saying to her, well, you know, I don't have black people on my staff. Um, she hadn't encountered many of the things that we'd, that I've encountered or some of the uh, unconscious bias or the people that want to see you as of less intelligence or the people that call you downright stupid because you're black. Um, there were many things that I would have encountered. I guess for me, it was about how you uh, fortify yourself. And I think my parents did a fantastic job. But equally, um, if I'm in a situation where somebody is exerting a, a, a racist slur or whatever, I can call it out, but I don't need to make it my problem because they're not responsible. I can only be responsible for me. I can't be responsible for you, Roger, or anybody else. I can only be responsible about how how I allow that to interfere with the way I'm going to be. So it's really important for, for me in terms of my success is to understand that, that your prejudice or your beliefs about who I am or where I come from don't really matter, do they? Because I know where I come from and who I am and what I've got to achieve and who I've got to set an example for. So I guess for me, I, I you know, one of the books that I remember reading um, many years ago that, that encapsulated some of this is um, Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom. Sometimes it is a long walk, but you can get there. I guess that book told me and, and his life experience told me that we can get there. And certainly that arduous journey from the 
island of Antigua to the island of Britain that perhaps wasn't paved with gold as people had been taught, um, they, they survived and they made it work for them. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to make it work for us. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a wonderful answer. Re Rebecca Myers, thank you, Rebecca, for this question. She says that giving, given the nurses are repeatedly re viewed as one of the most trusted professions uh, in Ips Ipsos uh, Mori polls, why do you think they're not invited more often to speak about healthcare issues more broadly rather than about nursing? And, it, and it's true that, I mean, you know, I, I watch Newsnight most nights and we, we've had endless epidemiologists talking about uh, the COVID, but I, d I don't think I've seen that many nurses. I think we saw you on question time, didn't we, uh, Donna? Is, is that right? Yeah, I've do, I have done a bit of news tonight. Um, and I guess I, my answer to that question is that um, we carried out some research in May 2020, actually, that looked about looked at nursing and looked at what the, some of the issues around pay restraint and the fact that it's a 90% female profession. And I think, you know, alongside, um, alongside uh, pay is gender bias. Yeah. And I think that, you know, automatically, even though you, you would are, you would are, you could argue that 50% of the medical profession is female now. Um, yeah. And that, but they will still, but, but it's historical, isn't it? So actually, when you think about the medical profession, there is a hierarchy that people ascribe to medicine and nursing. And I think nine, even though 90% of the, the nursing profession still remains female, it, it does suffer from gender bias in terms of pay, in terms of voice. If you think about, I'm forever saying, and, and it's not that you wanna nudge people out of the way, but as somebody that is the closest to the patient, that actually sits next to the patient, it's always it always interests me that when we talk about ICSs and all these massive mega structures or CCGs, the nursing voice is the last voice, and yet constantly we are we we interact with the patient on a daily basis. We hear their issues, and yet um, often not afforded the opportunity to put it on the table. Yeah, well, yeah, I I would completely agree with that. Um, We've got 51 questions now, and I promise we're going to get to them. But one thing I wanted to, met, to talk about, because we had Professor Turnbull on, uh, I think, last week, and she said something that slightly shocked me on our, that was the Thursday afternoon COVID thing. She, she said that she, she went to the Royal Marsden Hospital, and she was shocked by the way that the junior doctors there, nothing against them personally, um, were taking very little notice of infection control issues. They were all going to the doctor's uh, kind of um, room where they had all their computers. They were sharing their computers, they were sharing their sandwiches, and then going straight back to the wards. Uh, I mean, in terms of infection control, I think uh, um, nurses I, I take far more care to do this, I think. And, and uh, the other thing that, um, Jeff Scott, who's a microbiologist, sent me an, uh, a text about this or an email about this afterwards, saying that actually some of the infection control nurses are getting a hard time from the doctors because they're, they're saying, listen, COVID is a, is a transmissible disease and it's, it's all very well dressing up in your uh, protective gear, but you've got to wash your hands and you've got to sterilize yourself and you've got to be a lot more careful in the current environment. And any comments about, about infection control within the NHS? Well, I, yeah, and it's absolutely vital, isn't it? Because um, COVID is, as the spread of COVID and, and the more um, transferable variants have taught us that infection control, cohorting, social distancing, and up until, up until the, the vaccine, those are the things that we've used to keep it in check. So it's absolutely vital that we as health professionals, whether you're a doctor or a nurse, and I know that nurses are believed to be more compliant and therefore we're often the sort of people that get the infection control jobs and we'd run around after doctors saying, you know, bear below the elbows, all of the things that are important to keep patients safe. Um, and we do sometimes get a hard time for this, but it's incredibly important that all of us adhere to the infection control procedures, whether you, whoever you are, whether you're a physio, whether you're a radiologist, it, it, is, it isn't just that, it's also sometimes the hospital environments aren't conducive to proper social distancing. Yeah. And 
And, and I, you know, it's quite interesting that even when I was in the hospitals, it was really difficult to adhere to social distancing when you were outside of your outside of your PPE gear. And part of that might be our, our antiquated hospitals, our slim corridors, uh, the way in which we're just not used to social distancing and have to take extra caution. You know, how many people bung into a room, um, multidisciplinary team meeting, and the fact that we now know that ventilation has an impact on the spread of this virus, as well as the aerosol droplets, which we hadn't, I think, fully taken on board initially. Well, uh, Dr. Lynn Graham Ray wants to know about Victoria Climbier report, and we will come back to that, I promise. But but uh, Crystal Oldman, thank you, Crystal, says, can Donna say something about nursing in the community, uh, which in the UK seems to have been largely ignored by the media during the pandemic, yet more people have died at home from COVID than in, than in hospitals. So and any thoughts about that nursing in the community? So Crystal knows that I'm a community nurse at heart. Um, and um, we know that nurses in the community were, as I said at the start of this, were the, the, the most understated because we started in hospital and we all thought that if we could contain it in hospital, um, that that was it, job done. And actually, we, we also know that once it got into the community and we stopped tracking and tracing, people were being infected in the community. And, and so many of our district nurses um, absolutely uh, bent over backwards to make sure that vulnerable people in the community actually got the care. If you think about all the nurse-led services, if you think about care homes, it was nurses that were contending with the deaths in care homes. Think about the homeless team, and I know Crystal knows this, but it was nursing that, that, that absolutely made it understood that we had to get people off the streets in order to keep them safe from being infected by COVID. So uh, no matter, even though I always think of nursing as the silent uh, force, because no one turns around and says, well, you know, they put us on the top of the boards, they put us in SAGE, uh, to advise, but but actually, when we see the impact of something like COVID on our communities, we take steps to make a difference. And so, when we saw people going into hotels, uh, it was nursing that was behind that. So I, I just need to be clear, and that's why I can say that community nursing, end of life care, all of that was carried out by nurses. So it's not an ambulance going down the road or a police car <laughs> in, in, in E5. I've got a great question from Alex Penfold. Thank you, Alex. How will the uh, RCN support nurses who feel coerced and peer pressured into being vaccinated against COVID-19, despite no current plans for it to be mandatory? In some cases, nurses have been identified in their teams as not wishing to be back. He's vaccinated, which is distressing and breaches privacy laws. Many nurses feel ostracized and alienated, and I'm concerned this coercive practice will only worsen and nurses will consider resigning. What do you, what, what's your reply to that? I mean, it's, it's obviously uh, right and proper for me to say that we do have an effective vaccine, and therefore I would want to encourage as many nurses as possible to, to understand it and give their informed consent to taking the vaccine. But I, I, I would just add a, a word of caution that coercive practice is never a good thing. It's never a good thing because I do believe that when you're talking about medical treatment, I think ethically, it's a fundamental human right to determine what enters your body. And we would apply that in, you know, in many aspects of care that you and I have given over a number of years. We, you know, we know. So it's not the same as one radio presenter was saying to me the other day, it was health and safety and putting on a hard hat. It's not the same because this is something going into your body. Um, so while I am absolutely, you know, my arms out to take the vaccine, I think it's really important that it's the only way we've got of protecting ourselves out of this pandemic. So I would encourage every single nurse who is hesitant to speak to somebody, but actually when it comes to enforcing that, I would draw the line. I think it's not appropriate to be forcing people to, to, to you know, to take, to or forcing a vaccine on someone. It, it feels akin to holding someone down and jabbing them, which I don't think is appropriate for anybody. Yeah. 
So no, no jab, no job. You think um, not just in nursing that that. Uh, well, I I must admit I would agree with that. Although I do think you know having had uh, the, uh, uh, not vaccination myself, I would encourage everybody to have it because we, I'm not hearing from any of my my friends and colleagues and people at the RSM that that they're seeing any side effects apart from maybe a slight temperature in the evening. So, so let's talk a little a little bit about child protection, uh, Donnick. I know that's one of your big interests, and it it must have been traumatic for you doing the Victoria Klimbe uh, uh, report. Um, and and uh, I suppose that in this you know lock, era of one year virtually lockdown, we're, we're going to be seeing a lot more problems with that in uh, as we come out of it. So, w what are your thoughts about child protection and where we are now? So I think it's as important now as it's always been. I mean, you know, children are our future. So I think a society that affords its children protection has to be the right type of society and the society that we all want to live in. I mean, for me, that was probably one of the most traumatic things I've, I ever did. Um, partly because my own daughter, Lauren, was the same age as Victoria Climbier. So I think just being a member of that inquiry will always stay with me. But I think I was really proud um, of the work that we did on that inquiry because it was about making sure that we could share information appropriately, that we absolutely gave it a prominence at that time. And I know some of those things um, have been refreshed and re-looked at and done differently now. But I think for somebody that worked in health when, uh, you know, when I was a, a, a nurse in theatres, okay, and a child came in with a head injury and you couldn't attribute who did it in the house, that nobody was charged, we've come a long way uh, in terms of making sure that children have a right to protection. So for me, being a, a part of that, although it was tough, it was important because actually I think that that report influenced how we work together as health and social care and how we set services up, how we shared information, how we educated nurses and doctors to see it as not somebody else's responsibility, but actually that every job we do with children, we do on behalf of that child. Absolutely right. Um, there's a good question from Nick Paul Walker and Nick's actually been looking after a, um, a friend of a friend of mine. So thank you for for that, Nick. Um, he says, Donna, do you think it'd be beneficial for doctors and nurses to integrate more closely during training, uh, given how closely they have to work later on? During my medical degree, I don't believe I had any shared teaching of science, practical skills, communication, or anything else. Would integration help better team working and, and better understanding of the, of the different roles? I think it's interesting because, yes, um, I, I spent some time teaching in Poland um, probably a few years ago, and they actually all start off on the same pathway. Um, so from year one, two, three, and then the doctors continue and the nurses. Uh, but they, the education is similar. Uh, it's on a similar path, although to different degrees. Um, and they have some subjects separately. But I did think that that was fascinating because, uh, you know, throughout my entire junior life as a nurse, um, even if you never got taught by us in the, or with us in the classroom, you certainly got taught by us on the wards. Uh, partly because we were there, we were continually there. And as we had new medical students come in, we were orientating them and uh, helping you deliver uh, care in a safer way as possible. So um, I think it is something we should look at. Um, it, we'd have to break down a lot of um, snobbery and barriers to do it. Um, but certainly it's something that I advise my son is stay close to the nurses because they'll help you through your medical degree. Yeah, I remember, I mean, a long time ago that I was a junior doctor, but having a, a senior sister on the on the ward uh, when I was a, 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 a registrar, they used to call us in those days, was was absolutely invaluable. And they helped me so, helped me much more than the consultants that I was working under, uh, actually. And I, and I think, you know, that I'm, I'm throwing this out to 
the audience, many of whom will be members of the RSM. And those of you who aren't members of the RSM, you can join and we would uh, come in, the water's lovely. We're trying to outdo the Royal College of Nursing in terms of our membership. We've got uh, quite a way to go before we get to half a million, it has to be said. But, um, but you know, th th this issue of, um, of, of multi-professional training, I think that's something that um, maybe the Royal College of Nursing and the, Royal, and the RSM could collaborate with. Sally Tabor is one of our very helpful um, uh, members of the, and, and she's just posed a question saying that maybe since we live, since we're adjacent buildings um, on Henrietta Street, you know, we should maybe work more closely. And and I, I think that, you know there are things we could do in terms of a particularly online training now, which has mm -hmm. been transformed by COVID. We we could create programs that appeal to nurses just as much as they appeal to doctors, and we could get people to to interact uh, more closely. So in, in coming back to this issue of, of, of child protection, I mean, what's the solution to the fact that there may be more traumatized, more uh, damaged children coming out of um, this COVID crisis? I mean, is, is it education? Is it, uh, how, how, do we, how do we avoid this catastrophe? I mean, one of the things that having worked on the inquiry demonstrated to me in, in absolute clear terms was that child protection is everybody's business. So it isn't, you can't, you can never say, because you never know when you're going to be presented with it. It could be you as a teacher, it could be as a doctor, it could be as a nurse, it could be as an individual. And I think we will see more. It's absolutely true that we will see. And, and to be honest, it, it doesn't go away completely. I'm not sure that we could ever eradicate it. But I think it's really, really important for us to be vigilant. It's important for us to hear the voice of the child. Uh, you know, so many times, I think, um, after leaving the London, I w worked in Tower Hamlets um, as a, a child protection specialist. And it was so important that, that nurses, school nurses, community nurses, develop listening skills because that's that's when children want to talk to you if they know that you're going to hear them and listen to them so let's this is a good question from kiran deep hair um donna you you say your son's a trainee surgeon um i guess having watched uh, witnessed his journey firsthand is it's a is it a career path you'd recommend um talking about the hours the pay the work life i mean Tell us a little bit about your your boy. Let's give him a plug because um, maybe we he, he eventually he might become president of the Royal College of Surgeons. And um, I have a friend, Bernie Ribeiro, who was president of the Royal College of Surgeons. He was the first color man of color who was uh, president. Fantastic chap, Lord Ribeiro, he is now. So maybe your son could be following his footsteps. Well, yeah, maybe I'm not sure, but uh, um, having I have to say. Um, just when I was a when I was a student nurse and when I was a nurse working at the London on the wards, um, it was really important the camaraderie, the support that individuals get, um, whether you're nurses or doctors. But one of the things that I did know is that when doctors came onto my ward, they were supported because quite often, you know, when changeover period happens, you have to orientate them, you have to support them, and it's a, it's a form of patient safety. I suppose. Having been a clinical director in A&E and also listening to some of uh, just just hearing from my son, I think there is something fundamentally wrong with both the nursing and medical training in terms of how we hold those people. There's something about them belonging to a university, but not belonging to the hospitals or the environments that they sometimes work on, that, that sometimes they're seen as visitors. And, and I just remember uh, as a clinical director in A&E, it was it was so important to build those relationships you know I was always hanging uh, harking on to my consultants look mate build the relationship with your trainees so that you can support them and guide them in a way that we we you know we do and actually if you do that you hold on to them because it didn't you know I'm, I'm absolutely certain that my son only became an orthopedic surgeon because the consultant bothered to, to build that relationship and support him and um, and help him. So, uh, you know, there are some concerns I have, you know, when I ring him and say, how are you? And it was his first morning in a hospital and he had 470 patients. 
wonder how faith, how safe that system is when they've got a number of patients to go through and see and come back to. You wonder how safe that system is. And I think, uh, you know, the Gabbar, the, 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 the case tells us that sometimes the system isn't safe for trainees and we have a duty to try and make it as safe as possible, as indeed some of those systems aren't, aren't safe for nurses. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I was inspired to do urology by a consultant I worked with many years ago in, in Cheltenham. But I, I think, you know, important message is that, that, that doctors actually taking more care to relate and, and interact with the nurses on their wards would be a really good thing and vice versa for that matter. So building that kind of team spirit is the best way to achieve patient safety. Fiona Gray-Taylor says, good evening. Good evening, Fiona. Do you regard the length of shifts as reasonable, please? Alternating blocks of long days and long nights, for example, 12 hour shifts. Is that safe? Is that sensible? I, I have some concerns about the length of shift. Um, I know that uh, when you're in a, a system that is doesn't take the time to take care of you. You want to do your shifts and get out. So three long days might be attractive. But I've long held concerns about, you know, just witnessing so as a clinical director that it, on, on that 12 hour shift, uh, three quarters of the way through it, your staff are tired. Um, it, is an, it is a conversation I want to have. Um, I'm not sure that all of the nursing community will be, will be behind me because sometimes when you're working in a system that isn't as responsive, uh, responsive as you would like it to be, you just want to do your shift and get out of there. But it, I think it is something we should be debating about how, if, if, if we're saying that nursing, medicine is our critical safety jobs that you know they the people's lives depend on them um you you have to be a, a, the, on your best game then we should be thinking is it conducive to be working a 12-hour shift yeah uh, good there's some great questions coming through fiona uh, i've already mentioned her she says forget um the extra marathon it's the extra ultra marathon that nurses have to do <laughs> and then um, Rachel Nelson thank you Rachel says nurses hold the hospital together they're the nuts and bolts that enable doctors to function they're undervalued uh, thank you nurses for uh, everything that you do uh, I completely uh, agree with that living in in Hackney let's go back a little bit to your local um, situation Donna because uh, Hackney is an it's a buzzy area it's kind of um, uh, where the action is. Uh, I think the Murder Mile was was how, is it the Hackney Road that used to be described? One of those roads down there. Hackney Road that's described as the Murder Mile. Um, taught us a lot on how to deal with stabbings. <laughs> yeah, I remember the Homerton, we used to get so many stabbings in there. And actually as a surgeon, it was when you're trainee surgeons, it it, they're really interesting cases to look mm -hmm. after. You have to rush them into theater and trying to figure out where the knife had gone. And, and usually we managed to save, well, a good proportion of those patients anyway. But um, I mean, coming back to, to you know, racism um, and, and hackney, um, I, I, know, I, I think that, um, that, that uh, I bet your children got stopped and searched more than the average white kid brought up around uh, Hackney. And I know that's, an, that's a big issue. Uh, mm. and, 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 he, and if Cressida Dick, she's probably not listening to this programme, but I, th I th have a feeling that her cousin, uh, who happens to be a urologist as well, might be listening. So any messages for Cressida about stop and search and, and the, the kind of differential way that the police deal with black people in Hackney? Uh, yeah, I, I guess what I'd say to stop and search, I mean, having brought up um, two sons really, I want to talk about my daughter because she, she never ever complained about being stopped and searched, but uh, certainly for my sons, it was a continual issue. Um, I can remember my son, my oldest son, coming home one night and saying he's, he'd been stopped so many times between Clapton and Victoria Park. Um, it was like every two minutes for him. And I think um, Lammy looked into this uh, uh, some time ago, and I think it's just, it really is important for people to, to justify um, some of the reasons why they're taking those actions. Clearly it's equally important when you live in somewhere like Hackney and you, you know that you're experiencing lots of stabbings, we want knives off the streets. 
you know, it's that is absolutely critical. We want knives off the streets. We want children's and young people's lives saved. So there is a balancing act to have to do. But I think that anything that 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 positively starts to discriminate um, marginalizes populations, and it isn't helpful. Yeah, and, and I think you were saying earlier that that dealing with that in terms of your two sons, you know, getting them to kind of get beyond that. Guys, I suppose it's mainly the young ones that get stopped and searched, not not so much the uh, the more senior characters and, and 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 more men than women for sure. So uh, how how do you help them kind of deal with that, rationalize that, accept it in a way? I think it's the same way that um, my parents helped me deal with some of the other issues. I mean, I can remember my son, my oldest son saying to me one evening, um, you know, and I said to the copper, he said to me, what do you want to do, son? And I said to the copper, I want to be a lawyer so I can prosecute people like you for wasting my time. And I think my husband and I stepped in at that point and said, well, perhaps that wasn't the smartest answer because that could end, you could end up in a cell. We understand that it gets on your nerves. But actually, I think what you try and do as parents is hold them through those years so that actually they can get through it. And, and you know that perhaps there might be a time when they're not going to be stopped every five minutes yeah. and, and they can focus on their profession. I think as it's as I said to you in the beginning about the way in which I have to address things, is it's important that actually I can't take on the responsibility for other people's behaviours to me. And it was important to teach my children that. You know, you can't you can't be responsible if you, Roger, have grown up in a home that don't like black people. That can't be my problem. Mm. It, it's my problem to see that that's what you're from and make sure that it doesn't impact on me in a negative way. Yeah. So, and I think it's exactly the same when you've got a young policeman who thinks that it's a really great thing to do is stop every single black boy he sees because they're they're the the problem. Um, to actually educate our children that actually that might happen but if you if you put your arms around that and that stays with you you end up with a chip on your shoulder that that isn't going to get you anywhere very fast but that doesn't mean that the recommendations made by Lamy shouldn't be you know carried out it means that people should justify police I'd say to Chrisita Chris Dick you, your police officers have a duty to think about why they're stopping that young black boy or that young the, boy driving a nice car um, as though a black boy can't own a nice car that you know we do have to sometimes call it out yeah i agree with that i think i mean all of us need to change because you know the, the, it is society's responsibility do you think that the black lives matter uh, issue in in america which is kind of spread across the world um you know do you, do you think that's changed people's perceptions in a in a in a positive way do you know as i i think it may have done i'm never too sure about that because uh we've had incidents you know the rosa park incidents uh we've had civil civil incidents in america that have, we've had many movements here you know i'm forever thinking about how many people are killed in custody here in our own country and we grab onto America as though we don't have issues to address in this country. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's an interesting um, view that we've seen from society because whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever sort of person you are, you cannot help but have been moved by seeing that, that image of somebody standing on somebody else's neck. So, and, and that must, I think, give each and every one of us a, a wake up call to say, well, how does that happen in our society? And what do we need to do to address it? So it's not just um, the Black Lives Matter movement, but you know, every single person that saw that must have been moved around the injustice that that individual suffered and lost their life over. And therefore, I think we all of us have to question what sort of society do we live in? What sort of society do we want? And each and every one of us have to think, well, actually, I need to do better um, for a range of people that I come across, treat people better, pe treat people with dignity and respect. It, it's, it, it's not just the police, it's everywhere. We've all got to change as a society. Yeah. 
There's a question from Washington DC that shows that we're getting um, some uh, leverage here across the, across the globe, not just in the UK. Thank you, Esther Roberts, for asking this question. She says, are there further plans for providing mental health counseling support for nursing staff, which kind of raises the issue of, you know, I mean, we talked about child protection issues. We talked about the fact that nurses are underpaid and overworked. But there must be a lot of people who are actually suffering in inverted commas mental health issues as a result are we supporting them enough do we need to do more uh for these people who are traumatized by the deaths and all the extra work dressed up in ppe and itus any thoughts about that donna yeah, it's something the college has been looking at um we have had continual dialogue with nhs england and uh, the NHS really, and we ourselves as the Royal College of Nursing have invested quite heavily in counselling services. So the services are being provided, moral distress or, uh, or the distress from all of the things that people have seen over the last year throughout the whole of this pandemic, we know will increase. We know that while people are still under pressure, they will see themselves working through it, and then when they stop, we will have an exhausted NHS work workforce that will require some attention and regard and and that lends itself to how we step services up going forward. Um, it's got to be right and appropriate that we give people rest, although we do know that we're dealing with resting work the workforce on one hand, but also making sure all the cancers and all the things all the operations that have been missed or not done yet do take place. So I think there's a balancing act. But what we do know is that we need appropriate therapies for those people who have experienced moral distress. Yeah. And we will yeah. the college do our bit. Yeah. Well, dealing with the backlog, you know, we had a, a, a we would a Thursday afternoon session on that last week, actually dealing with the, the four and a half million patients on the waiting list. So there is a massive amount of, of work to be done. And uh, I think, it, the, you know, a lot of the things you've said resonated really, really well with, with at least with me and I hope I hope with our audience, too. And, you know, I, I, I think it's clear that doctors and nurses, you know, we, we need to work more closely together. We need to be um, more closely bonded as a team uh, and uh, on behalf of, of our patients. So there's some great messages coming across. Well, don't go away uh, yet, Donna. It's like two minutes to uh, eight, so it's time for me to stop. But I, I've got a few announcements to make about future things. Um, so I've been mentioning several times about our Thursday lunchtime COVID series, 12.30 um, PM until about 1.15. And Simon Wesley, my predecessor, will be talking to Professor Robert Dingwell about pandemic sociology. So I think they'll bring out a lot of the things that uh, we've discussed here. Next week on uh, Wednesday evening at seven o'clock, uh, we've got BBC's David Clementi being uh, uh, interviewed by, Robert, by Richard Murley, one of our trustees. That should be really interesting. And the week after that, George Osborne, uh, uh, former Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, is on our show. So we're, we're pleased uh, about that. Two, two other things before I finish to mention. Um, climate change, we didn't get a chance to discuss that, but we, we could have done. Um, Donna, uh, we're, we're lucky that uh, His Royal Highness Prince of Wales on the 16th of March is um, uh, giving an introduction to our 10 programme climate change series. We're very proud of those. So do tune into that and then every two weeks through to July, we'll be discussing the health implications of climate change. And, and I suppose our message will be, climate change is gonna damage uh, our health, even more our children's health, even more our grandchildren's health. Uh, and perhaps by emphasizing the health aspects of climate change, it may make people change their, their lifestyles themselves. And finally, talking about lifestyle, uh, the wine correspondent of the Times, Jane McQuitty uh, and David Gleave are, are running a wine tasting uh, series, well, two programs on the 25th of March and the 1st of April. And you can log on to those and you can order the wine. So Donna, uh, I'd like to finish on, on a last question. Um, somebody say, saying that if you could choose one thing to tell Boris Johnson to do uh, for the future uh, of healthcare, what, what would that one thing do? 
Um, I'd probably stick to pay your nurses properly, Boris. Um, they're fundamental to how we've um, got through this pandemic. So just, yeah, reward them and value them and keep them going because actually we might need them another day. Yeah, well, I'd agree with that. So Boris, if you're hearing, listening to uh, Donna Kinnair and Roger Kirby, we think a 12.5% pay increase is the right thing to do. And, and talking about money, um, I know that people think the uh, Royal Society of Medicine is a rich organization. Sadly, we, we uh, because of the pandemic, we're looking at a 4.6 million pound loss this year. Um, so uh, this program is free for you, but it's not free for us. It takes quite a bit of time uh, to organize things. So if you would like to make a donation to keep the RSM going, we've been around for 215 years. We'd like to be around for another 215. And we, I, and I definitely, uh, Donna, promise you that uh, we will try to work a little more closely with the World College of Nursing. We're next door neighbors. So let's get together and see what doctors and clinicians can do for the, on behalf of their patients. And if, if you feel generous, please make a, a, a donation. And if you'd like to join the Royal Society of Medicine, we would love to have you. Thank you so much, Donna. Have a great evening. And uh, I just loved that interview with you. I really, really enjoyed talking to you. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.